This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, why rural hospitals are closing their maternity units. It's something to be very concerned, and I think it's an indicator that we are shifting risks that lead to poorer outcomes. When distance costs lives, when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. Can I keep my dad's skull after he dies? Can I give grandma a Viking funeral? What happens to an astronaut body if they die in space? The curiosity around death that one woman hopes to answer. Then... It takes five gallons of water to pre-wash a pair of jeans so they're soft when we buy them in the traditional method. What's really behind the cost of those cheap jeans from H&M? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. When a woman is expecting, she wants to do everything possible for the safe arrival of her new child. A hospital close by, equipped for every imaginable complication, with doctors and nurses at the ready. But over large swaths of America, that's available less and less often. Since 2010, 113 hospitals in rural areas have closed, according to the National Rural Health Association, and a large number of hospitals that have otherwise stayed open have shut down their maternity wards. It is a really big trend. It's been going on for quite a while, at least a couple of decades, and probably longer. That's Dr. Carrie Henning-Smith, Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and Deputy Director of the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center. We know that in the decade between 2004 and 2014, 9% of rural counties lost their hospital-based obstetric services. That is, they started the 2004 with a hospital in their county where someone could go in and have a baby in an obstetrics unit. And by 2014, 9% of those counties didn't have such hospitals. So we know that as of 2014, fewer than half of all rural counties have a hospital with an obstetrics unit where someone can go in and have a baby. We also know anecdotally that those losses have continued and we are working right now on crunching the numbers to see what the exact number would be, but I can almost guarantee that today it's even lower than 45% of all rural counties with a hospital with an obstetrics unit. When a hospital's maternity unit closes, often a town's available prenatal care goes away with it, and women have to travel to another town or city for care even before their baby is born. Getting prenatal care becomes a lot trickier, a lot harder. There are, I do want to say, there are some hospitals that close their obstetric unit and still try to provide prenatal care locally where you're only traveling to give birth. But there are plenty of other situations where the hospital either closes all of those service lines or the hospital closes altogether and it can become a lot harder for someone to get prenatal care. The people who this impacts the most seriously are low-income folks pregnant people who are maybe working an hourly wage job, they don't have paid leave to go see the doctor. And if you're asking someone to drive an hour or even two hours each way for each prenatal appointment or to go get an ultrasound, I think it makes plenty of logical sense that someone might not go to all of those appointments if they're needing to choose between working their job or even keeping their job and making it to all of these routine appointments. When women have to go to another city to deliver, there's a greater likelihood the birth will be scheduled, either for an induced labor or C-section. But moms can't always make a schedule, and babies, of course, don't always stick to them. A lot of women, when they're pregnant, don't leave their communities until later on in their pregnancy. And part of that is that a lot of women are caregivers for children. Leaving is a very stressful event. And so they have a tendency to stay as long as they can in the communities that they're in, even if they don't have obstetrical services being offered there. 
as a result, then uh, things happen during the course of pregnancy that can be life-threatening. Dr. John Cullen is a family physician in rural Valdez, Alaska, and president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He says even when everything goes according to schedule, an induced labor or C-section aren't as good as letting nature take its course. Labor is not something that can be predicted with any kind of assurance as far as when it'll happen. And when we start being too prescriptive and too, you know, trying to schedule things, that's when we have worse outcomes because whenever you intervene in a normal pregnancy, then you're more likely to have bad outcomes. Even for those women that deliver in a metropolitan area from a rural community, their outcomes are not any better and are, in fact, worse than if they had stayed in their community. Cullen says studies have shown that when the travel time to the nearest maternity ward is more than an hour, the chances babies are born somewhere else go way up. Henning Smith says the closure of obstetrical units shifts the risk of childbirth from the hospital to the family. We found that when obstetric units are closed, especially when they're closed in more remote rural communities, we see an increase in people giving birth outside of the hospital. And that might be a planned home birth. It might be a really happy and wonderful event. It might also be an unplanned home birth or even a birth on the side of the road that comes with a lot of risks and can be really a frightening experience for everyone involved. We've also seen an increase in people giving birth in hospitals without obstetric units. That's almost always someone going in and giving birth in the emergency room. And then I think most Strikingly, we've seen an increase in preterm birth for those people living in the most remote rural counties who lost their obstetric unit. And preterm birth is the number one risk factor for infant mortality. It's also a risk factor for all sorts of other health and developmental issues. Cullen still has an obstetrical unit in his 10-bed hospital and has seen cases where it saved lives, where an emergency room alone might not have been enough. He says births will still come to the hospital, even if it doesn't have a maternity unit, but they'll be unplanned emergencies. I think the scariest case I've ever had was a 12-week miscarriage where the bleeding was incredibly profuse. And again, if we had not been able to manage obstetrical emergencies, we probably would have lost her. And we lost almost a liter of blood just going from the ER to the operating room. Regardless of whether hospitals plan on doing obstetrics, they're still going to be doing obstetrics. They're just not going to be ready for those emergencies when they happen. We did have some what we call precipitous deliveries following the closure of our unit. And believe me, it's a very unnerving experience for the emergency room physician that's having to deal with that situation. And... Fortunately, it didn't happen very often. That's Brock Slaybaugh, Senior Vice President of the National Rural Health Association and a former hospital administrator who was forced to close his hospital's maternity unit. The reason is almost always the same, financial trouble. 46% of all rural providers have negative operating margins. You've got states like Kansas where 86% of the hospitals are losing money on operations. When hospitals are starting to look at their finances seriously, losing money, they look at service lines, and service lines are the ways that we kind of divide up our business units, if you will, in the hospital setting. In those service lines, you can kind of evaluate whether they're making money or losing money, and unfortunately, in a lot of rural communities, the service line of delivering babies is not at all profitable. So Slaybaugh says economics have left many rural hospitals little choice but to close down for moms and babies or close the doors completely. Another hospital that I know has closed their unit down and it immediately had a positive bottom line impact of about $500,000. So if you're losing money or you're looking at maybe closing the whole hospital, your long-term thoughts are probably not foremost in your mind when you're just trying to keep the doors of the hospital open. A variety of factors are to blame for the dire straits many rural hospitals find themselves in. The first, as you might expect, is what hospitals get in payment for the work they do. Reimbursement rates for giving birth are relatively low across the board and tend to be particularly low in Medicaid programs. The exact reimbursement rate varies from state to state as Medicaid is administered at the state level. 
But usually the rate that Medicaid pays does not fully cover the cost of keeping an obstetrics unit open. And we can't have this conversation without talking about Medicaid. Medicaid pays for 51% of all births in rural counties and nearly half of all births across the country. But in rural areas, it's more than half. And so Medicaid is a huge player here. Other factors include things hospitals can do nothing about. One is the shrinking demographics of many rural areas, where Henning Smith says there are fewer people and patients to support a hospital's bottom line. We also have declining birth rates and fewer people of reproductive age living in rural areas and so fewer people giving babies. So maybe your other service lines are doing okay, but you're not delivering as many babies and it's harder to maintain that service. It's expensive to keep an obstetrics unit open because there's a fixed cost to always having the equipment there, having the lights on, having the heat on in the winter, the AC on in the summer, and you always need to have someone staffing it because it's unpredictable when someone might come in to deliver a baby. Workforce shortages in rural areas are a big problem. Slaybaugh says most doctors who deliver babies there are family practice obstetricians. But hospitals also need nurses, anesthesiologists, and other staff who are always on call whether they deliver 50 babies a year or 500. So many hospitals figure it's better to concentrate on other areas that are more in demand given the changing population. We know that the demographics of rural areas are changing. They tend to be older, older on average than urban areas. For a lot of those reasons, a lot of hospitals focus quite heavily on the Medicare population, which is really important and appropriate. But by doing so, we sometimes miss out on what needs to be done for those people who might still be having babies and living in the area. And because there are fewer people in many rural areas, because we have an older population in many rural areas, Hospitals are dealing with a really wildly fluctuating patient volume, and so there are some rural hospitals where they may go a whole week or even a whole month and not deliver a single baby, and then they may have two babies in one week. And so just dealing with the staffing of that sort of variability is really challenging. Dealing with the costs of that sort of variability are really challenging. And when a maternity unit doesn't deliver babies very often, keeping staff sharp in their skills can also be challenging. That need doesn't completely go away if the maternity unit closes, but just who needs to be trained does change. Are we training first responders? Are we training people who fight fires who tend to be volunteers in rural areas? Are we training police? Are we training anyone else who might be a first responder to know how to deal with someone going into labor on the side of the road if that does happen? How else are we including the community and training the community to support one another and to support families in this new reality that we have? However, the community loses more than safety for pregnant women and their newborns when a rural hospital closes its maternity unit. Sometimes it leads to the entire hospital closing, and hospitals can be the biggest employer and economic driver of small towns. We anecdotally have heard a lot of stories of places closing their obstetrics unit And by doing so, they lose some of the trust and some of the faith of their community. The community thinks, well, if I can't even have a baby here, if I can't do this very fundamental piece of human life and human health, then what can I do at the hospital? So there's that little piece of trust and faith in the hospital system. So what can hospitals, communities, and government do about it if they want to keep maternity access available in rural areas? More adequate reimbursement, especially in Medicaid, would be a start. Helping to make medical careers in those areas more attractive would be beneficial, too. But changing demographics mean the trend may be hard to stop. Housing supports for women and families who need to travel to larger towns and sometimes wait for delivery have proven beneficial in overcoming time and distance. But even larger towns are not immune from the maternity closing trend. Cullen says that even there, consolidation of hospital operators means some are closing down their labor and delivery units and sending women to another hospital farther away. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. This week marks the start of the Medicare annual enrollment period. 
a time for Medicare-eligible people to choose the plan that best supports their total health. While physical well-being is often top of mind, CVS Health's Path to Better Health study found that one in four of those 65 and over report feeling socially isolated. Here's Christopher Chano, head of Aetna Medicare, a CVS health company. Feeling isolated from friends and family can take a toll on your mental and physical health. Many Medicare Advantage plans include extra benefits to help you stay connected, such as fitness memberships, transportation, meal delivery, and in-home support services. The Medicare annual enrollment period runs through December 7th. Learn more at aetnamedicare.com slash listen. That's aetnamedicare.com slash listen. Aetna Medicare is an HMO PPO plan with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in our plans depends on contract renewal. If you receive a cancer diagnosis, there will be many things to learn and manage. One is understanding that cancer and some cancer treatments can increase the risk for blood clots, especially in the first few months after diagnosis. Dr. Ralak Karana, professor of medicine, Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, says it's important to create a plan to protect your health. Make sure your cancer doctor knows if you have a family history of blood clots and that you recognize the signs and symptoms of blood clots. Signs of a blood clot in the leg or arm include pain and swelling with skin that's warm to the touch, red or discolored. Signs of a blood clot in your lung are difficulty breathing, chest pain that worsens with a deep breath, coughing of blood, and a faster than normal or irregular heartbeat. One in five blood clots are associated with cancer. Knowing your risk, signs, and symptoms will help to protect your health. Learn more from the CDC and the National Blood Clot Alliance at stoptheclot.org slash spread the word. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it, you could junk it, or you can donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-835-1478. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you, you'll receive a free three day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now. Call 1 800 835 1478. Donating is easy, and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher for donating. Call now, 1-800-835-1478. That's 1-800-835-1478. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and RadioHealthJournal.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. The social perception is that they're not committed or perhaps not skilled enough in just one. And so they're compensating by having a second or third job. The psychological highs and lows of the gig economy. Then caring for strangers. As one doctor puts it, it's good for the soul. What love requires is the ability to believe that their experience of their life is as important as your own. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.